Tell me, how is it a project like Polkadot, ranked number 13 in terms of the size of its market cap, is one that we all know about, but yet some of the big guys are still acquiring it in droves? What is the secret sauce that is making these whales feel like it is so undervalued right now, even though it is ranked so high? Well, actually, there is a definitive answer to this question, and it is one you're likely unprepared for. You see, everyone knows Polkadot. Everyone understands what it generally is being used for, but everyone's kind of forgotten about it. But have you ever thought, hang on a second, why is it still ranked so high? Well, again, this is going to be answered in this video. Prepare yourselves, because the answer is likely going to make you want to FOMO in. But I would recommend to not FOMO in, take the information on board, do some more research, and then, and only then, make a critical decision. But a bit of financial advice I would actually give you right off the rip is to subscribe, because that is your key to crypto success. Pokemon has always interested me because this was the first project I really got sucked into. I made a lot of videos back when the parachains were launching about two and a half years ago, so a lot of you might still be here from when I was known as the Polkadot guy. So yes, I think this is an amazing project. I mentioned to you moments ago how the whales are basically accumulating the coin, and it's true, right? These top 10, top 50, top 100 wallets are increasing over the course of time ever so slowly. I mean, it's not easy for someone to come on and drop like two, three, four million dollars into a coin, but they are increasing, which is an important metric to have a look at because obviously something is brewing. But most importantly, what I really want to draw our attention to is this chart. As we can see, basically over the last 12 months, if I zoom this right out, that we're finding just average altcoin holders are increasing for Polkadot, right? The last time I covered this, which pretty well was 12 months ago, there was about just over 1 million holders of the coin now we're seeing this increase to 1.3 million. And not just the daily holders, but also the daily active accounts and newly created accounts, as you can see here, has just about doubled in the last 12 months, which is an important metric to have a look at because what this and the daily holder chart tells us is there isn't just a general buzz with Polkadot, right? What you typically would find with projects gaining traction, bringing in that cheap, quick, easy, pumpamental money, but this gives us an indication that the project and projects are being used, which has, I believe, been propagated by the fact that Polkadot is much easier to use. Some of these wallets that previously had high barrier to entries are easier, plus the addition of new wallets, as well as the overall ecosystem, i.e. the parachains and these upgrades are bringing people into this. Now, I'm not here to talk about price, but I did want to say, if you manage to buy Polkadot over here in the range of about $3.70 to $6.00, in the last bear market, I think that would be a fabulous entry for this project. I'm not saying now isn't a good time to buy either. Again, I'm going to refrain from talking about entry, exits, price predictions, so on. But to look at the macro lens, I think Polkadot's got a fair way to still go. Some of these fundamentals I'll talk about momentarily here support the fact that Polkadot should easily blow past its previous all-time high. Actually, matter of fact, we're basically already one-fifth from that level. So I think an easy 5x from here to go even higher, who really knows for sure. Now, what is Polkadot? You might be asking yourself, what's he on about here? Well, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about what Polkadot is because fundamentally, all it really is, and I say all like it's just a pretty generic thing, it's really not. It's a layer zero. So it's actually a level beneath typical layer one projects that you find out there. That's even the likes of Solana and Cardano, right? These support dApps or sometimes even some of these coins like Neo Protocol support layer twos, but Polkadot supports layer ones as well. So it's like the layer beneath it. Ultimately, what it's offering the ecosystem is a layer where it's basically a decentralized computer, almost like a cloud. It's a cloud for blockchains to be created on top of in a seamless way way now these things that are built on top of it are called parachains and these are like again inbuilt layer ones basically they're actually layer 1.5 projects and these can leverage this security and the speed and the interoperability of Polkadot, which is another one of its main features Polkadot is looking to connect the entire web3 space together it doesn't care who you are or what your you know ideology is if you're a layer one blockchain or a layer two whatever it wants to connect together. And it's invented a very unique messaging system to allow this to happen. You'll find that Polkadot has a lot of firsts in crypto and it fundamentally is one of the true crypto innovative plays 
in the entire market. For starters, I love the idea that Polkadot has a sister net, right? A project built from the same people that built Polkadot, right? A side chain, if you will, a testing environment maybe even called Kusama. Kusama is a canary net. Now, a canary net in essence is basically just a test environment. It is a main net. It doesn't have its own projects on there. It is completely independent of Polkadot and does its own thing with its own ecosystem. But things happen here first and much faster. Governance is faster. Everything happens first. And this allows for a really unique thing where a lot of projects tend to suffer by having a test net where they test things before it goes to mainnet and there's always problems that occur on the mainnet. Well, they have a test net, they test things out on Polkadot and Kusama, like before it goes onto these projects, but then it goes and ships to Kusama first. All any existing issues that, you know, may come up are ironed out first and then it ships over to Polkadot. And that's not to say that Kusama acts as like the test bed where everything goes wrong and then Polkadot's the final finished product. Kusama has its own growing ecosystem of unique projects as well. Most of these projects are actually, again, the Canary Net projects of the projects built on Polkadot. Take a Kala built on Polkadot, the DeFi hub, right? Its sister net or its Canary Net built on Kusama is Karura. Same thing over here with Astar. Its side chain, again, Canary Net is called Shiden, built on Kusama. The list goes on. A lot of these projects do have them, some don't. But in essence, what this does is allows for, of course, more connections built on two different networks, of course. But you allow this much more finalized, complex, and ultimately groundbreaking product to be created on Polkadot as well. So in my opinion, it works great hand in hand. You find a lot of other projects out in cryptocurrency. What they tend to do is they have their test environment and then they think they've sorted everything out because there's only so much you can test in a test environment. Goes to mainnet, all these problems come up, the network has to shut down. But in Polkadot and Kusama, happens on testnet, goes to Kusama, then goes to Polkadot, the much slower but more adopted network. And I think in part because of this, Polkadot has a very complex ecosystem. These projects built on top of it are layer ones. These do things to a whole nth degree of what a dApp dedicated to the same things could do. Take Nodal, an IoT layer one, obviously connecting all the smart devices of the world for the betterment of humanity. Ace the Network, a layer one building, of course, a layer two ZK powered project on Polygon, similar to the likes of Manta Network. There's a reason these projects are leveraging their layer ones on Polkadot. Clover Finance, account abstraction, a very important point of what I believe to be the future of crypto. Latentry, a decentralized ID project. Akala, a full DeFi hub. Parallel Finance, Hydra DX, Bifrost, all built around DeFi, Crust Network, a CDN, Content Delivery Network. Moonbeam, a similar project to A-Star and Moonbeam. I mean, the list goes on, but the fundamental aspect here and the underlying principle remains the same. These projects are building on Polkadot because they're able to leverage the underlying security of the staked in Polkadot itself. They can be very easily instantaneously connected to one another and projects outside of the Polkadot ecosystem, and it's very fast. But the problem here isn't the ecosystem. The problem with Polkadot right now is the way you become an ecosystem project. It's all done through these things called slot auctions. And we'll talk a bit about what these are here because it is an important reason as to why they're moving away from that to go now to Polkadot 2.0, which should make this ecosystem much, much larger and more robust. So currently there's only 100 parachains able to connect to Polkadot because they run through these things called auctions. Basically, it's who has the biggest D, if that makes sense. Who can put the most money up at one given time and then the network randomly selects this random snapshot and whoever has the most money or dot bonded to the current auction wins that slot for up to a maximum of about 23, 24 months. So you can only have it locked in there for two years and be guaranteed a parachain, right? So one of these guys. But the issue, of course, is the fact that, well, first of all, you have to have tens of thousands of dot to be able to win. If you're a new project, you're going to have to raise a fair bit of money and you can't compete with the guys like A-Star, Moonbeam, and so on, who have been able to acquire a lot of this revenue over the course of the last two years. Again, you have to maximum lock up for 24 months, which means you can't, you know, have this locked in for a long time. There's only a maximum of 100 of these things can be hooked up at one time. There's a huge, of course, barrier to entry given all of this information. And if you are a new project that doesn't have those requirements, right, the money or, you know, you just want to test your product, 
you can't do it, right? You can hook onto these things called para threads, pay as you go parachains. But if you are wanting to leverage the full force of the Polkadot ecosystem and the interoperability aspects of it, you really want to be a parachain and you can't without, of course, those requirements. So in Polkadot 2.0, what they're doing is saying bye bye to this old model of having this very big barrier to entry, having to hook up as a parachain for a certain time, bonding, all that sort of methodical stuff. And they're saying hello to block space and you're able to rent what's called core time. So I guess the easiest way I can kind of describe this is in each blockchain, of course, you have block one, two, three, and it just keeps, of course, going. What they're essentially saying is as a project, you can actually rent out a given part of a block. Obviously, a block holds a certain amount of data. And to visualize this, you know, you might be able to, if you're a very fast and, and heavy computational project, let's say you're a gaming project that requires 10,000 TPS, all this storage, so on, you can rent out a larger chunk of this block space. Okay, again, literally the space inside of one of these blocks in a blockchain and then have that dedicated towards you, okay? And then you obviously will have that continuously uh, locked out yourself for everything, every single block. And this is great because a part of this new model, as we'll talk about here in a second, is that as a smaller project, right, you can actually come in or even as a project just testing the waters of the capabilities, you can rent out a very, very tiny amount for a lot less and therefore, you don't have to pay all that dot and bond that dot up, okay? So, of course, this is going to be a lot better for newer projects. As I said before, much more robust ecosystem can be created because you can just punch into this. You buy your time in Polkadot. Fantastic model. And so, the way they describe it is if block space were the resource of any Web3 project, and it really is. As a project, you know, as someone who's using a DAP on Ethereum, the reason why you pay extra or a lot for your fees is because these blocks are extremely congested. So again, it plays in a part. If you could, as a Web3 project, as a DAP on Ethereum, for example, rent out a certain amount of block space given every single time, as long as the demand doesn't supersede that amount of block space you've rented, you're not going to have those issues, which is, of course, the beautiful part of exactly why this model is fantastic. And again, core time is the unit in which it's measured. So, and core time is what they say here as the unit in which it's measured. So you're renting out that core time, okay? You're pulling into the Web3 core, uh, as it were, for the Web3 cloud that is Polkadot, okay? So again, pay as you go. It's great for startups. You can pretty much bulk pay for a maximum of one month at a discount or as little as a week. Actually, they're even talking about renting out individual blocks. So going right down to the individual block itself. And again, bulk pay. So this is all going to be part of their core time marketplace, which is again, getting rid of this. You just jump in there as a project and rent out as much as you need. They're also burning core time revenue. So there's an extra burn mechanism on top of this as well. And they're still burning part of the fees generated from the transactions, okay? So the two sides of it are your bulk core time payments, duration for four weeks. This is more so for your long-term use. So you still have the ability to rent it out for longer, but of course have the benefit of it being cheaper with a discount, or again, having the immediate use being that one week or even lower uh, time frame and pay as you go. And this is all built on top of the most versatile framework in cryptocurrency. It's called Substrate. It was created by Gavin Wood for Polkadot and Kusama. It allows smart contracts to be very flexible and allows developers to put whatever their mind wishes into code and create it. So Solidity, Ethereum, these sort of smart contracts built with that framework are very constricting. I'm not a developer myself. This is all what I've heard. But Substrate allows for much more complex smart contracts to, to be created. And because of this, we've seen Charles Hoskinson come out and say that Cardano will be leveraging a partner chain created with Substrate, which is, of course, very, very big. Not just this, we've seen a Polygon Avail. Uh, these guys are a data availability play built off Polygon. Actually, one of the co-founders of Polygon is looking to spearhead this, uses Substrate as well. And the bonuses don't just stop there. Polkadot is actually a completely decentralized network, so much so that the SEC classifies this thing as a commodity. So it is not a security. Therefore, this gives me more confidence in the longevity of the project. It is completely decentralized and governed by the open gov. Everything that happens on the network goes through public open gov. And it's not just that, but the Nakamoto coefficient score ranks it in the top echelon of projects, a 94 rating. And what that basically means is that it takes about 94 of the validators combined together 
to overthrow the network to overtake 33% of the economic value or stake in the network, which is a big part of a proof of stake project. The more this requires, right, the more nodes that have to come together, the harder it is, of course, either the more stake in the network or the, you know, more decentralized it is amongst those validators as well. All that to say, in my opinion, this is one of the many reasons why Grayscale has added Polkadot to its new dynamic income fund, an index of some of these crypto projects. So they have Osmosis, Solana, and Dot, and a few others. Dot being about 14% of the index itself, which is quite large. Of course, this is going to bring more institutional investors, ideally, into this group of assets, or particularly, of course, Polkadot. And I believe might be the first step in the door to something much larger, its own ETF, for example. And over the last six months, Polkadot has been averaging about 1.5 million daily active interactions from the likes of you know, Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, and so on, with about 1.8 million averaging the last three months. So it's apparent to me that it is picking up steam. Notice how the last three months it's been averaging higher, and you can very well see over the last six months that it is picking up dramatically. So this is, a go of course, a very good sign. This is what ultimately brings in that dumb degen money into a project, aka just fuels the pumpamentals, basically. Not just dumb money, though. Developers are choosing to build on Polkadot. The number of newcomers who wrote code in each crypto ecosystem or well, Polkadot was like the top seven. If we exclude other, whatever other is, you guys can't quite see that over here. Polkadot's, I think, number seven, right in front of Neo, right behind Arbitrum. So it is a good side to see because developers, of course, create applications. Applications create a community. Community creates, well, price going up. So here's some really big upgrades coming to Polkadot that you need to be notified of. First of all, asynchronous backing. Asynchronous backing is going to allow the network to have blocks occurring every six seconds rather than every 12 seconds. So faster finality, essentially, and lower latency, and also allow the network TPS to occur much faster. So much so that they can, in aggregate, process 100,000 to 1 million TPS across the whole network in any one second. That's quite ambitious, but that is what is expected to come very soon. This is all, of course, again, built on the fact that these blocks will happen much faster, again, two times faster, and the parablocks themselves, the generation time, so the amount of stuff that can be added to them will go from 0.5 seconds to now two seconds, so a total of eight times faster, which is going to be really, really good for, again, this block time and this block space to, to prosper. Of course, with these new networks are going to come in now, so there's going to be more demand on the network itself. So this is really big stuff. Also, I mentioned earlier on in the video, this very unique messaging protocol created by Polkadot, and that's called XCM or Cross Consensus Messaging. This allows you to interact with other consensus mechanisms very seamlessly. So there's no really big problem when it comes to connecting with other networks within the Polkadot ecosystem or without as well. Now, this itself isn't actually a protocol. This is a messaging format the protocol or the vehicle that will allow this communication to happen is the XCMP or the cross-chain messaging protocol. So very similar ones, XCM, one's XCMP. Don't get them confused. They work together. And I think this is a very important aspect of the network because this is what is going to enable the true vision of Polkadot, not just being a layer zero leveraging layer ones and allowing this ecosystem to build in of itself, of course, on substrate, but allows the whole Web3 ecosystem to be connected together. Bridges are extremely unsecure and inefficient. So this is going to pretty much allow um, you know, other networks to hook up to Polkadot or Polkadot's parachains on a universal messaging format. And one of these new projects leveraging this is the Snow Bridge, basically a bridge between Polkadot and Ethereum. But because it leverages the cross-consensus messaging format with XCMP, it's going to allow a really complicated transaction to occur between these two networks, pulling in all of that liquidity on Ethereum over to Polkadot and vice versa, which is what the network really does need. So I'm excited for Snowbridge. My only question really is what's going to happen to the likes of Moonbeam, who kind of relies on some of that Ethereum to Polkadot traffic. But overall, the Snowbridge is going to be able to allow any of these transactions to go directly to any parachain. So I think overall, it is really positive for the Polkadot ecosystem as a whole. And the last thing I'll leave this video on is the runtime upgrades that allows forkless updates to happen. Typically in most other networks, when you want to upgrade the network, you can do two things, hard fork and a soft fork. 
A soft fork allows a software change to happen and everyone can keep running the same network, basically. Whereas a hard fork says, okay, you either move to this new update or you get left behind. You can split off and you create a completely different network that keeps running and we will do our own thing as well. And so this allows for the hard fork in this case to occur without actually hard forking. So everyone's on an equal playing field. There's no splitting up liquidity. None of that sort of stuff happens, okay? So it's a very big thing and a big issue in cryptocurrencies. Ethereum recently had their hard fork. They lost a lot of nodes that decided to keep running the proof of work system. And those who went to proof of stake obviously kept running how it was. So it's all a big benefit of a couple different things. Most importantly, the fact that they're leveraging substrate okay it's all built on that sort of framework so this is some massive stuff guys all things you really need to consider as well and so this is part of the reason why i'm a big you know bull of polka dot i currently do not hold any polka dot tokens and the reason being is because i'm a human i only have so much money in my back pocket i don't have a money tree in the backyard and i've already made my buys but for sure polka dot is one of those projects that has a very prosperous future and in my opinion hits a lot of the massive aspects I look for in both a project for the long term and also pumper mentals. So thank you for watching this video the whole way through to the very, very end. I really do appreciate it. If you made it this far, let me know with a like down below and I'll talk to you all very, very soon. Take care. Bye.